The Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Database Talks are made possible by Ottitune. Learn how to automatically optimise your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottitune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. All right, guys. Uh, thanks for coming. It's another Vaccination uh, Data Seminar talk. Today, we're excited to have uh, Brian Plotz. He's the CEO and co-founder of Flurry, a blockchain graph database uh, that he's going to talk about today, the internal architecture. Um, we appreciate Brian for being here. Uh, his, his wife just had a baby a few weeks ago, uh, so he's actually outside giving this talk to, you know, to, to make sure I have at least you know, a quiet room, a quiet area to give the talk. We appreciate him spending time with us instead of helping his newborn. So, but he's here to talk about data. So that's, that's why he's doing it. So as always, if you have any questions for Brian as, he given, as he's giving the talk, please unmute yourself, say who you are and ask your question and feel free to do this anytime. That way, we don't, Brian doesn't feel like he's just talking to Zoom by himself for an hour. Um, and with that, Brian, the floor is yours. Thank you for, so much for being here. Yeah, well, thanks, Andy. I really appreciate being invited to come. So this is exciting. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm bundled up a little bit. It's a little chilly here in North Carolina, but it's the only quiet place in the house right now. So uh, uh, yeah, so thanks. And, and by all means, interrupt. I'm, I've got my, uh, I just have my laptop out here. So it's full screen on the presentation. So uh, I can't really get into the chat messages. I'll of course get into those, or, or Andy can interrupt me uh, if something comes in. But I, yep, I can get into those later. But yeah, just just interrupt me, speak up. I can uh, talk and talk and talk, especially about databases. Um, so what uh, we're here today, there's just so much that uh, we try to accomplish with Flurry. There's a lot of different things we could talk about. Um, we decided that in order to fit this into one presentation, we would focus on one specific problem, which is uh, how do we scale? Um, and uh, some of the unique things we do to scale our query capability to the edge. So Flurry has a pretty unique architecture that enables this to happen, but it uh, fundamentally, all the components that make up what you would think of as a typical database need to be structured in a slightly different way to be able to make this happen at the end. So uh, I'll start out, I'll first talk at a high level. What is Flurry? What do we do? What makes us unique? Uh, I'll be very brief with that. Of course, we have a website or feel free to pipe up and, and ask questions. Uh, we'll talk very briefly about the architecture because the architecture, kind of a high level conceptual architecture, then informs that kind of edge scaling capability. Then we'll have to talk a little bit about indexes um, because indexes and how we do indexing ends up being very important to the scaling component, which we'll get to, uh, hopefully will be, you know, at least half of the talk, but that's, uh, that's basically the destination that we're headed to. So uh, what is Flurry? Um, and I'll start out with a high level philosophy of the problem that we're trying to solve with Flurry. So we are incredible believers in this concept of data centricity. And we think that is uh, almost the opposite of how we've been doing things for, you know, 40 years or so in computing, which we consider to be application centric. I mean, most, uh, most companies, most businesses, whatever the case may be, are asked to develop an app and developers go, they develop an app, they develop uh, some front end UI, usually web-based nowadays, they develop a bunch of code in an app server. And then in the course of that, they say, okay, well, we have state, right? We have data we need to store somewhere. And then they try to pick a database that meets whatever needs that they're going to. And of course, there's a lot of options out there. And it's the same developers really that are developing the app that end up developing the database, de designing the database. And they really design it with that in mind as a place to store state for the app. Uh, when we talk about data centricity, we really talk about thinking about data first, not the app first, and making sure that data is strategically described and highly reusable across potentially many applications. And we think this is going to be very important for organizations to have this kind of fundamental shift in how they think about data over the coming years, especially as we're getting 
more enthralled in this data-driven economy. Uh, so for them to survive, they're going to have to be better at understanding and leveraging the data they have. Most organizations have a lot of data. It's not the quantity of data that they have that's the problem. It's really the quality and how they're able to leverage it outside of that application-centric sort of viewpoint. So when we move to this model, a few things have to change when we think about databases. So the interaction model, kind of this first, first kind of line in the grid here, um, in an app-centric standpoint, the interaction model is one-to-one. -one. There's only one thing writing, and there's only one thing reading from the database. Now, that doesn't mean that you couldn't have thrown a, a data lake or a data warehouse in the back end to crawl, you know, scrape data out of, but it was really designed to only have one thing talk to it, which is the app server that's sitting in front of it. In a data-centric approach, it's a many-to-many -many approach. There's going to be many writers that could come from multiple apps. And excitingly, they could even come from many different organizations. And I think that's where, you know, kind of the future ends up moving. And of course, there's many readers as well. So the database has to exist in a model where that's just given. There's going to be lots of writers and lots of readers to the data, not a one-to-one -one model, which is what most databases today do and focus on. And so the, then that hits the next line, which is how do we secure the data? Well, if there's only one thing reading and one thing writing to it, we might as well write the security in with our app server. So it's sitting in custom code and that's fine because that's the only thing writing and reading. But in a data centric model, the security needs to be co-resident with the data itself. And we often refer to this, that data has to defend itself. It has to understand how and who is able to write and read. And that can't live in an app server because there is no app server. It needs to be co-resident with the data. And then capacity. And this is really, I think, where we're going to kind of drive into quite a bit today is that um, while there's still a lot of challenges in scaling your database in an app-centric model. At the same time, you have a lot of control over it. You know, if you have queries that are taking a long time, you can rewrite the queries. You can optimize for that. You can create views. You can do a lot of different things to try and make sure that your data layer is scaling with your app. Because again, you're the only thing talking to the data layer. So there's a lot of control. So it can be... Uh, Capacity can be uh, controlled to a degree, but in a data-centric architecture, again, many apps are reading, many uh, apps or even organizations are writing, you all of a sudden need to think about scale, I think, a lot differently because you have a lot less control over how those queries are going to come in, who's running them, and you need to be able to perform and uh, have horizontal or, or sort of this linear scale capability, particularly on the query side. So Flurry is designed as a solution to uh, be a data platform for this uh, data-centric sort of world. And these, when we think about uh, the components that have to go into a data platform or a database, if you will, to live in that world that we just talked about, we think of these layers that have to be there. So at the core is trust. And especially if data is getting natively shared across apps or even across organizations, how do they validate it? Uh, I often draw the comparison to the little green lock or whatever color it is in, in your web browser that shows up in the address bar that shows cryptographically, you know you're on Microsoft.com or you're on Carnegie Mellon's website. And that little green lock tells you that there's no way anyone could have manipulated that data in the interim. Well, when we have data talking across the web or across organizations, they also need that green lock. So trust and integrity around every piece of data becomes important. We think every piece of data should be traceable and provable that it hasn't been manipulated. And we should be able to give that little green lock to every datum that exists. Semantics. Uh, so Flurry is a semantic graph database, sometimes called the knowledge graph, sometimes called a triple store, sometimes called the name graph. These are all sort of different uh, names for the same thing. But semantics is where we can describe data in these globally unique terms, and it allows us to automatically integrate data together. So we think semantic, semantics is key, especially if data is getting shared in these multiple contexts. 
Again, if the only thing talking to it is your own app in an application-centric world, then semantics don't really matter because you control everything. But here's a world where you don't have that control. Semantics become critical. Security, who can write, who can read. In Flurry, we have a capability we call smart functions. It is an entire application programming environment and a virtual machine that can run co-resident in the data itself. Um, and uh, we won't be talking a whole lot about that today, but that's a core capability of Flurry. And then time. And All right, quick, you know, quick question. Yeah. Is, that, is that a full VM or is that a container? Like what is the actual, like, uh concept you're using to run code? It's a, it's a sandbox container. So it doesn't actually spin up a separate physical VM, but it basically parses, validates all the code and will compile it into reusable bytecode that it can execute quickly. Like, 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 like BPF. Well, I'm not sure what BPF is, but it's, if it's you a, say it's, so. Yeah, it's like, you, it's, it's like a, it's a DSL. It's not arbitrary code. You compile it, verify it, and then instead of running it in the kernel, like in Linux, you're running it inside a container that you control. That's right. That's yeah, got right. it. Okay. Yep. So um, then, of course, there's time. So time, uh, we think, is just critical, especially when you're sharing data. Uh, typical databases were designed for probably historical reasons to destroy state to destroy prior pieces of information. I mean, that data might exist in a log, but it only knows about one moment in time, which is the current time. Well, when you're sharing data and trying to collaborate around data, especially across parties, how can you collaborate around something unless you have a consistent view of it? And you can never have a consistent view of information if it's constantly changing underneath your feet. You don't know, you know what data Andy is seeing and what data I'm seeing, unless we can coordinate and lock in time and then all of a sudden machines know they have a consistent view. So sometimes we call this like GitHub for data, but we have inherently in the system, it's what we call bi-temporal. Uh, we have the ability to issue queries and execute queries at any historical moment in time. And this is incredibly uh, fast and efficient. So it doesn't, you know, you issue a query for the data as of a year ago, it will respond in about the same amount of time as you issue a the same query for the current moment in time. So uh, time in this environment becomes critical. And then of course, sharing. And this is where we start to get away from maybe having to develop custom APIs, for example, to share data across organizations. Organizations sitting on the foundation that we can just talked about can now issue queries because security is going to limit what they can see and can't see at the data level. Uh, time is going to allow them to get consistent results for queries. And now they're more in control of the data they are asking for in the shape of it, instead of us having to build, you know, a thousand APIs for a thousand different views of the same data. And then at a high level conceptual view, what does Flurry actually look like? And this is where we'll start diving in and, and we'll talk about how we scale this capability to the edge. There's really two main pieces to Flurry. There's what we call the ledger backplane, which you're gonna see on the right, and then the query servers, which are right next to it. Now, most databases, you issue queries or reads and updates or writes to the same physical machine or the same service. In Flurry, we actually separate the two, and this, this becomes important to the scaling service. We don't think there's a necessary a, a need to have these as the same service, and you're always kind of battling whichever is your weak link in this model. The ledgers are only responsible for the writes in Flurry, and the query servers, servers are only responsible for the reads. They're completely separated services. Now, of course, they communicate and talk, you know, if you're connected to a query server or your app is, and it wants to update data, the query server will just take that and forward it on to the ledger server for you. So it's not like you have to physically connect to a bunch of different services, but they actually operate independently. So the ledger is the source of truth. The queries are where all the reads happening are happening. Every interaction 
with whether it's a query server, a ledger server, happens through these kind of layers we identify in the middle here, which is identity. You have to prove who you are to interact with the system. It is a zero trust database, meaning if, if you can not properly identify yourself so that it can determine what you have the rights to do, it won't even talk to you. And it starts to even open up uh, kind of crazy sounding ideas, but I think exciting ideas of why not have your database on the public internet if it can protect itself then it doesn't need to sit behind an app, behind a firewall, behind another firewall. It can actually exist out there where anyone with the proper permission can access it. Smart functions are a way that we can uh, write code to actually programmatically enforce these permissions. And then provenance, so this idea of tracing data changes through time. And all this ends up getting represented in a pretty simple way, at least I think a simple way to the consumers of that data is a knowledge graph. It's a semantic graph database. We happen to support SQL as well and GraphQL, but Sparkle and, and our own query language, FlurryQL, are the primary ways that you would get the most power out of the system. Because it is a graph database, if you're querying it with a sort of a rectangular query language like SQL, you're gonna get rectangular results and, and you know, some rectangular nuances. So it sits there as a knowledge graph. That knowledge graph can consume uh, ontologies as well. So it can do inferencing if that's of interest. So uh, things like schema.org, uh, NIME, we do a good amount of government work. That's the bigger ontology that the Department of Defense and other groups are focused on. There's lots of ontologies out there describing lots of domains and Flurry can natively support those. So it, like, it, the comment you made about like, oh, you could have your, the, the ledger backplane have the data just out, sitting out in, in the public. I mean, obviously it has to be encrypted. So do the queries, I mean, is it encrypted at rest and do, do the query servers have the decryption keys and how do you protect those? Like, how does that work? Yeah, the service can sit there on the internet. That doesn't necessarily mean that the data has to be encrypted. Um, so that means just that you can issue SQL, SQL queries, for example, uh, just using a relational mindset. You can just issue SQL queries to the database. The database has the ability to read and write the data directly. You don't have the ability to necessarily get direct access to the file system. You have the ability to issue SQL queries. It is going to protect the data based on your identity using uh, public-private key cryptography. But there's other ways that we can allow this to happen as well. Okay. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Hamid, you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, I unmuted. Sorry. sorry. So, so I think there is some overlap with what these Cambridge semantic guys are doing, uh, use of the triple store, but also on a large amount of data with OLAP. So what's your view of it? And I'm sorry, I missed the first part of your question. I think you mentioned so a specific it, vendor name. Company, company called Cambridge Semantics in Boston yeah. area. Okay, so what's your view of it? <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, there's a number of uh, semantic graph database vendors. So Cambridge Semantics, there's, you know, um, uh, Stardog, uh, there's, of course, the Apache, the open source Apache Fuseki. Um, so there's, there's a good collection of vendors in that space that I would all consider competitors to each other, certainly, and somewhat competitors to Flurry. So they are all basically triple stores. Uh, they don't incorporate any of these components that we talked about really here in this private sl uh, previous slide. So they don't include things like time travel, data defending itself, trust and uh, provenance around data. So these are unique capabilities that Flurry brings into that space. Um, but uh, yeah, certainly from a pure semantic graph database or knowledge graph database standpoint, um, they would be considered a, a competitor. Yeah, okay. Although they are all up database, so they have to deal with a lot of high volume insert and the load and all of that stuff. Yeah, sure. Well, and that's part of what we're talking about um, here as yeah. we're going in is how do we how do we scale this uh, and scale this in a horizontal way? Thank you. Yep. Okay, so now we're going to kind of work towards 
how does this scale? And uh, when we talk about scaling, we also talk about this idea of scaling to the edge. We think that, um, well, there's a lot of neat things I think we, we think that a database should be. Uh, one of which is that it should be able to act sort of like a content delivery network, but a real-time one where the database can exist anywhere in the world. It can be spun up and spun down on a whim. If I have a big analytical process that I need to run, I could spin up a database, uh, run my queries against it, and spin it down after 15 minutes if I don't need it. And I had quite literally zero impact to any other running service on that database. Um, so we'll work our way up to that first to kind of introduce this idea of uh, separating kind of the system of record with the ledger servers and these query servers. We'll talk a little bit about how you might physically deploy a Flurry service. So there's kind of four different ways that you can um, deploy it, and they're listed here on the left. The one is just on a single server. Server. So Flurry is open source, by the way. Um, you can uh, we we build sort of pre-build jar files, so it runs on the JVM. So you can just download them from our website. You can go to GitHub, get the source, build it yourself. Um, but when you're developing with Flurry, for example, it's very common uh, to just run it on your local laptop. So uh, you could run it like this in production as well if you wanted to. But uh, just to run it on your laptop, you're just really running one single service. So this is the first way that you can deploy Flurry. Um, so it's going to run on the JVM. You can containerize it. You can run, you know, we have a cloud service you can run it on, or you can just run it on the JVM locally. Um, and you have multiple choices for where the data for that ledger server is going to actually be stored. So things like object storage in the cloud, like S3 are an option. You just run in memory. Uh, and that's a fine thing to do. Obviously, it's not going to persist uh, state between uh, downtime, but perhaps for testing or other reasons, you just run it in memory, or you might use local disk and, and run it on file storage. And that single ledger server can now have all these different things connect to it. So it can have things connect to it and issue queries either over an HTTP API or we actually have the ability of embedding the entire database as a library inside of your app. Um, so we really like this idea. I really like this idea of a database as a variable. And especially when your database has become immutable, we, we stop talking about databases as being sort of this thing that's mutating and changing with every update. We start talking about a database being a single immutable database as of a moment in time. And the next time there's an update, there's a new database. So you can, can get this idea that a database ends up being a variable in your code and you can pass it around between functions and do whatever you want with it. And just like any sort of data structure sitting in your code, it's, it's never going to change unless you mutate it or do something. But then you have basically a new version of that data. So we even have a version of Flurry, our query servers that run in JavaScript. In fact, you can run the entire database engine if you want inside of a web browser. And we do some cool things well, like with React to make that all work real, real time. So again, this all gets into kind of this idea of separating the idea of the, the ledger or the source of truth from the query services which can be in different languages as a library, or they don't have to be. You can still sort of use traditional ways of sending a request across the wire, having something else execute the query, and then giving you back your results. For us, we do that typically which in, with an HTTP API request. So that's kind of Flurry as a single server. Now, this is where we start to scale because the query servers are designed to actually exist as an independent service. So now instead of all these things talking to your ledger server, which is really just responsible for doing the writes, now we've offloaded all the reads capability. And of course the ledger server is gonna get every single transaction, process it, update it, validate it. And then of course, broadcast the results out to the query servers. And in fact, you can have as many query servers as you want. Like I said, you can spin them up for 15 minutes, shut them down. The query servers are in memory database servers. So obviously the longer they're running and the more memory they have, the more they're going to have resident there to answer queries on the fly. Uh, 
Of course, as soon as you start it up, it's not going to have any data in memory, and it's going to have to pull a lot of that data to bring it in memory to start answering queries. But once it's got a lot of data in memory, you're really running, or it has the data in memory it needs for a particular query, it has the ability to now run it in memory speeds. And this is the part that we'll get into a little bit more. The ledger servers themselves can also scale. In fact, they can even be run decentralized if you like. So multiple organizations can run ledger servers. They can have voting and consensus around whether transactions are valid and obey the rules. And again, the rules exist as data alongside the data as well. So the rights can scale with the ledger group. And being a semantic graph database, one of the nice things is, is you can connect graphs together. So you kind of get away from this idea that a query has to talk to a database and you can start to have a query that can actually do joins across multiple databases. And this is a really great way of scaling because if you don't need ACID sort of uh, um, semantics around a transaction, there's not necessarily a, a reason that that data has to exist in the same database because you could query across database and do joins very easily across databases. And then of course you can get to the point where these different nodes can connect to other nodes and other ledgers and you're running more in the decentralized world. So I'll pause there and then we'll talk about sort of how we scale up these uh, um, query servers with by starting out talking about our data structures in indexes, but uh, see if we have any questions that have popped up. Yeah, so I mean, I have, I think a similar question is for me, just like, Camille's asking what's the main goal, OLTP versus OLAP, so then he asked about like, you know, which are, which are, do you support transactions? I guess my question is like, what's the ideal use case or application scenario for something like Flurry? Like when would somebody want this, this sort of, you know, this, this completely decentralized architecture, uh, and are you and again, are you targeting like front end applications, things are powering websites or phone apps, or is it back end analytics? Yeah, so good question. So a lot of the semantic graph world very much focuses on analytics. They do not operate as a system of record. Flurry does, it can be used like that. So I'm not saying that's a poor use case for it. You can still create these knowledge graphs. You can still put in ontologies, for example, to do that. But it really does want to be a system of record because it has time travel, because it has this provenance capability. So it really wants to be the system of record that, uh, as I started out, ideally multiple apps and multiple contacts can leverage that data because it's semantically described, it's interoperably described, uh, and it can protect itself. It doesn't just have to talk to a single app that's controlling everything about that data. But usually people are building an app, right? They're building some sort of product and they're saying, I want my data to have integrity. I want it to be able to be leveraged in multiple contexts. I want to be able to share it with securely without having to build an API for every table in my basically traditional database record. I want to be able to secure it so people can ask whatever question they want. And if they have permission to see the data, they can see the data. So we do focus on what we call more data centric, uh, um, data centric use cases. Um, usually starts out with a single app that someone's building, except they have broader visions of who's going to leverage that data and how it's going to be leveraged across multiple apps and multiple orgs. Great. Uh, any other questions before we keep going? All right, go for it. Okay, so this is uh, somewhat technical, except I think that was the intention of the talk. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about data structures and indexing because um, that's obviously very critical when we think about how we scale out in-memory databases on the fly anywhere in the world. So let's take uh, here a very simple set of data. Uh, I don't know how much the group, I guess I should ask the group and maybe Andy, you know, um, have you spent much time with graph databases? Is it more just relational databases? What's the familiarity? Uh, so, I mean, on the research side, we're focused on uh, relational databases, but there's a bunch of people here that aren't at, at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, some former students 
some people from IBM Research. So, you know, it's everyone. But everyone, everyone knows databases. And I think we still want to remember craft databases. Okay. All right. So uh, Flurry at its core is a gra uh, graph database. Sometimes it's easiest to start out when we're thinking about graph data and just looking at it in the form that everyone's used to seeing data, which is in a spreadsheet or rectangular form, which is kind of the domain, of course, of uh, traditional SQL databases. So um, this is uh, some simple data here that we'll be dealing with. Uh, obviously, we have rows on the left. Uh, with different people, and then we have columns, um, and then we have values sitting in there. The difference in what makes this, uh, this data end up being a graph is that everything you see in the little angle brackets is actually a pointer to another row. And that row doesn't technically have to be in the same database. That row can be in a different database. So we see, you know, in the is interested in column on the right, we have some pointers to some different, you know, in this case, uh, uh, artists. Um, those artists could exist somewhere else. They might exist in Wikidata, which happens to be a semantic graph database. Um, but in the other case, we have like is friend of column kind of in the middle there. And these are all pointing to other rows that we see in the left. So a graph just allows any node to point to any other node. We don't have this kind of level of indirection that a relational database would have where you have to kind of go through a table to get to another piece of data. So um, what we can do is we can actually represent all of this data as RDF, as what we call triples. And they're called triples because there's there are three tuples. Um, so all the data that we had in the spreadsheet on the left is identical to all the data in the right. We've just turned it into our triple format. So the first element of a triple, we call it a subject, is the row. So you see all the Alice data, then the Bob data, and then the Jane data from our Alice, Bob, and Jane rows. The second part of the triple is the column. Um, so this is where we have, you know, is a friend of, is born on. And then the third part of the triple is the value that we actually see in the cell on the left. So this is the graph. This is a triple store. This is a knowledge graph. These are how this data ends up being. A beautiful thing about a triple is that it's a very generic format of representing data. Any conceivable piece of data can be represented as a triple. And it's very flexible. You can take triples, and if they're in you know, the, the right format, you can push them into a relational database. You can push them into a document database. Or of course, they can be a knowledge graph database as well. Flurry technically extends the triple, and I'm not going to get into any of that in the presentation, although happy to uh, take questions about it. We extend the triples to incorporate time, this ledger concept. We extend the triples to, uh, as we're incorporating time and linking to transactions and the provenance of data, to also represent whether we're asserting data or retracting data. So you think of a typical database, there is no such thing as retracted data because anything that's retracted or deleted is just gone, right? So there's no concept that there is a piece of data that used to be there that's now gone. So Flurry extends the triples to also incorporate this information. We also technically extend the triples to one additional component. So we, we have six components to our triples. We call them flakes which is a set of metadata about those triples. So this can incorporate things like language tags, enabling multilingual databases. This can enable things like expiration dates, something like Cassandra. One of the features I always loved about Cassandra is you can expire data. So it can hold expirations and metadata. It could also include property related data uh, sometimes called RDF star, but this is basically like Neo4j as a graph database, but a completely different class of graph database called property graphs. Uh, so we can incorporate property components into here as well. But we're just going to focus on our simple sort of three tuple triple structure uh, here. So um, now we need to think about queries because that's what databases do. So how do we structure indexes so that we can be very efficient with queries? So in this case, we just sorted everything by the row, then by the column, then by the value in it. So 
On the left, we have a Sparkle query. One of the cool things about Sparkle, I think, is that the query format is also consisting primarily of triples. And it's really like a pattern match of the data on the right. It makes it, I think, very easy. Uh, people maybe aren't familiar with uh, Sparkle and, and querying graphs, but I think the fact that your query format is identical to the data format uh, can help a lot. And here we're trying to find all the people that Bob has said they're a friend of. And in the where clause, we see the first part um, in, in yellow here, Bob is a friend of, and then we just do a variable binding. And we want to see everyone that Bob said he's a friend of. And then you see in our select statement, we're just pulling out that friend variable. And you see the data on the right. This would be very efficient in this, if this is an index, for us to find this data. First, we find Bob. Then we find the column, and it's exactly how our data is sorted. So our data is really just a sorted set, and we're just going across those columns. So we don't really have to do anything except just keep this data on the right sorted in this exact format to be extremely efficient with a query that's structured like this. And we call this index the SPO index. In fact, in Flurry, we call it the spot index because we incorporate time in the index as well. But again, I'm just focusing on the triples, which stands for the sort order. Subject, which is the first kind of row in our triples or the first element of the tuples. Predicate or property, which is the column name, the second part of the tuple. And then of course the object, which is what they call the value over on the right. So, so far so good. But let's have another query. And here we wanna find all people who are of class or of type person. And you see the data on the right and what we need to match because we no longer have the first part of our data, we have the second and the third, we'd basically have to do a range scan across the entire database to answer this question. So everything highlighted on the right would be our matches, but we'd have to go row by row to do this. This obviously is gonna make our queries very slow. So we wanna fix that. And that's where our next index comes in which is the POS, which is just swapping the sort order, where now we're sorting first by the column or the predicate or property, second by the value or the object, and then third, we have the subject, so the row, basically. So now the same query obviously becomes extraordinarily efficient because now I can look at is a and scan to that really quick, and now, of course, hit person, and then I'm going to get all my values there at the right. So there's two indexes that now allow us to answer a lot of queries in a couple different formats. There's really only one more index we need to be able to be very efficient with almost any type of query. And this one we call the OPS, or in Flurry, we'd call it actually the OPST uh, to fold in time. But it's the object. So we're, we're gonna be sorting on the value first, then the predicate, then the subject. And this helps us answer questions about what is connected to something else. So in this case, we wanna find everything connected to Picasso. As you can see from the query on the right, the only thing we have filled out is the, the third part of the tuple, the Picasso value. And once again, if we use our, just how we had this data, sorted by default and beginning to do this, we would, as, as you can see, have to do, again, a range scan of the entire database, basically, to answer this question, because we'd have to find every, every place Picasso was in that third sort of place in the element. So this last index, what we do is we actually flip the subject and the object, and we sort based on those. So the only thing we have to include in this are links to other things because scalar values don't make sense. So in this case, for example, we have a bunch of values in here like dates and you know these string values. Those don't really matter at all for this index. Only thing that matters are things that point to other things because those are the only types of questions that we're trying to answer. So now we have three indexes and between these three indexes, we can answer virtually any question you could ask. Technically, in Flurry, we do a fourth index, uh, which I won't get into, which you need if you're not going to index all the values 
that you end up putting in the database. But if you, let's just say you index all the values that you put in the database, you can answer any question extremely efficiently with these three indexes. And we're just sorting those triples in three different ways. Are you sorting the, the entire triple with every entry in the index? Um, yes, although it's summarized. So what we do in Flurry to make this very efficient is that everything you see, for example, in this particular um, index right here is represented by a long integer. And that long integer is actually an alias to the row identifier, to the column identifier. So in this particular one, we're, you know, every row and every column and every value point to other rows. These actually just get stored as long integers. So the long integers end up being extraordinarily efficient, obviously, to store. So if you actually looked at our index table, you just see three numbers here. They're also very, very fast for comparators. So as we're joining data, you know, we have very simple where clauses here. Obviously, a lot of where clauses would be combining multiple sets. And as we're combining multiple sort of statements here in our where clause, we've got to do joins between these variables or comparators between these variables. Computers are extremely fast at doing comparisons on integers. They're pretty slow, most of them, at doing comparisons between strings, for example. So the more we can keep in the integers, we're lightning fast. The, the, the predicate, I feel like that would be like the object and subject, you would have um, potentially a, a lot of unique values. The distribution of the data or the values would be uh, pretty widespread. Whereas like predicate is a friend of, is interested in, like there's only so many predicates I imagine in these databases. So you could do you know, pretty heavy compression like RLE or other things to, to reduce the index even further. Are you guys doing those kind of things or is it just, you're just doing 64-bit uh, encoding? Yeah, so we do represent the predicate as a standard 32-bit integer instead of a 64-bit integer, just because we technically never need more space than that, but they're right. still integers. And keep in mind in a semantic, in a true semantic graph database, the predicates themselves are actually rows. They're actually subjects. So that allows us to, you know, everything is data. Everything's a triple. Even the predicates themselves are represented as separate triples. So technically, like, is a friend of here is actually another uh, set of triples. It's a subject itself that might describe things about it. It might describe that it's multi-cardinality, single cardinality. It might describe that it's uh, um, uh, required or unique. But, 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 the, but the number of unique values for predicates, I think would be much less than objects and subjects. So like, again, for, for your example here, you only have two different uh, predicate types. You have is friend of and interested in. So like I, if I did run length encoding, I could compress that even further. Yeah, I mean, you could, except ultimately these are aliases for other rows. So if all of our rows are represented by an integer, yeah. then the only thing that we can do to reduce the space because they're, they're frequently used is to use the small end of the integer range to end up representing the numbers. Yeah, no, and so we end- So is friend of, you represent with the number one, but you have what? You have. So instead of storing one, 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 one over, over again, you store one followed by the, the length of the run. So you store one and then you say, I have six of them. So you just store the number six. So that gets you two integers instead of six. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, like, these are standard like columnar compression techniques. Yeah. I, I was just curious if there's something different so, because it's a RDF versus no. relation data. No, but one of the things that we also do focus on is just using standardized ser standard serialized encoding. So we use Avro to do this. So uh, okay. in this particular case, we're using Avro. So okay. we're just following whatever sets of uh, you know optimizations Avro is going to allow, which is primarily you know in maps around key values, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Limited. Yeah. That's a big thing. Thank you. Okay, and um, okay, so I'll skip over those. So then, because um, we're, we're 
running low on time. So let's look at our original index, right? That original list that's sorted by rows, then columns, then values, and turn it into something that looks like a B tree. So here we have a B tree that um, is representing all of those values that we just looked at. We're representing those values across a few leaves. And of course, those leaves all point to a root node or a branch node. So now we introduce this idea of a query server. So the query server just started up. It has no data. It knows how to connect back to the ledger servers, or it technically can even point to another query server that has the ability to connect back to a ledger server. It really doesn't care. It just needs to connect to something that can relay the source of truth or the actual data to satisfy queries as they come in. And now there's an app sitting in front of that query server and the app issues a query. And here a very simple query is select star from 10. So again, this query server is cold. It has no data in memory at this point. It needs to satisfy this query. And for one, we can look at the query and we can say we can solve this query from our uh, SPO index. So remember, you know, we have three technically in Flurry, we have four different indexes, but we can look at a query, we immediately know what index is going to be most efficient to satisfy or indexes, because many queries may hit multiple indexes, but which index is going to be required to actually satisfy this query, SPO index, so that's fine, that's what we're looking at here. First thing we need to do is load up the root node. Now in Flurry, these are actually stored as every one of these nodes is stored as a separate file. So what we're doing is we're pulling up entire files to these query servers. In this particular case, we have four files, right? Each leaf is a file, that's three files. And then of course we have the root node, which is itself another file. We have four files that house all of this data. So the first thing we need to do is go to the root to look up where the data for Ken is going to be. And so once we pull up the root, it's going to allow us to know where we need to go next to find that. And it basically tells us that that is in this particular leaf. We now pull up the leaf and we're able to satisfy the query. So this is all we needed to do. We needed to load two of our four files to answer this query. The query server now has two of those files in memory resident. Indexes, like everything in Flurry, are immutable. So the query server has a guarantee that the data in this leaf index will never, ever, ever change. Uh, Cassandra, with its SS tables, for example, works much the same way. It'll never update an SS table. We only throw garbage collect, throw out, and, and create new ones. So now the query server has these two files, which contain this data in memory, and it treats it like a stack. So if the query server has lots of memory, it might be able to hold a million of these files. If it's running in the browser, co-resident in the browser, it might only be able to hold 10 of these files. So it's very flexible for the query server, depending on how much memory it has, determines how many of these files or pieces of the stack it can hold. And then it just uses an LRU cache to basically kick out whatever it can't hold as it needs to satisfy additional queries. So a new query comes in. Um, I don't know if you just saw it change at the top, select star from Jane. So here now the query server first has to go to his root and say, where's the data about Jane? And it turns out it's in the same leaf that had the data about Ken. And it's able to now answer this query. It did not have to go anywhere else to answer this. It already had everything it needed in memory to answer this particular query. And now I have a new query. My Zoom controls are in my way a little bit. Uh, select star from Bob. And here again, we went to the root. We said, where's the data about Bob? Oh, it's over in this leaf. We had to now pull in this leaf. Now our query server has three files in memory, right? So this is all fine and good, except databases get updated. So how do we handle keeping the state up? And this is where some of the challenges come in. So now we spin up another query server and some app over at that other query server inserts a new record about Tom. And I think you can easily see that the Tom data is gonna sit sort of in that third leaf that the original query server doesn't have. 
And what we do in Flurry, because we don't want to re-index data all the time, and we want our indexes to be immutable, so they're very cacheable at the edge, is we have this concept around novelty. Novelty is where we put all of the changes since the last time we ran an index. So as that transaction, you know, it was proven with identity, it passed smart functions, validation, permissions, and ended up getting transacted, that gets pushed out as a stream to every query server. And all these changes, the query servers end up putting into their novelty bucket. And what they can very quickly do is merge all the data and novelty into the index leaves when they need to do so. And we have two components of novelty. We have sort of the base novelty and then novelty max. Um, and I can get into those um, if we have time. I know we're, we're starting to run low, but this helps control the index or the ledger server and tells it when it can run new indexing jobs or when it should run the new indexing jobs. And then when to stop the world, when basically you're saying all of our query servers have filled up the maximum that we ever want them to hold in memory, and we're not gonna accept any additional updates until a new index is able to fold the novelty into the index tree. But say we've reached this novelty threshold with this one update, and we need to run a new indexing job. So again, you have control over this with Flurry, how much data we hold in this memory queue. Um, but say this was enough to push it over that queue. In the background now, we can start running a new indexing job. And that indexing job is gonna create, in this case, two new files. One is we're gonna create a new leaf. We're actually gonna throw out the old leaf because again, we never update a leaf. We never update anything. Um, that would break all of the caching upstream and all the scale characteristic that we're trying to do. So we created a new leaf. And then of course we have to create a new root because it now points to a different file. So we've created two new files by folding in that. And we now have nothing in our novelty. Our novelty is fresh now. It can now accommodate new updates as they come in. And now we have another query that says, you know, select star from Bob again. Identical query that we just had. But now we had to load up a new root because the old root was discarded, but the new root actually pointed to the original first leaf there and it was never updated. So it remains in cache and never had to retrieve that file again. So the idea is the longer these query servers run, the more data they can pull up in memory and cache. And of course, as indexes are generated, they're only gonna affect the leafs of the data that physically changed. All the leaves of the data that hasn't changed remain in memory and, and fully cached. And then lastly, I'll touch as to how we look at how, you know, what these B trees effectively look like. Um, and what we have settled in on is that a branch node holds about 500 children in each leaf, which physically holds the data, we try to keep around 100 kilobytes because again, these are the chunks that are being requested by these query servers upstream and they have to hold in memory. So 100 kilobytes we found is a pretty good spot. In, in a typical database, about 100 kilobytes of data represents about 3,000 triples. So 3,000 triples fit in one of these leafs because each branch has 500 children we can look at the size of the database on the left. So if we only go one level deep, we have 500 children. Each set of nodes can have 100 kilobytes or each leaf. That means a 50 megabyte database can fit one level deep. Two level deeps, we're up to 25 gigabytes. Three levels deep, we're up to 12 and a half terabytes of data. And four level deep, levels deep, we're at a uh, but a little over six uh, petabytes of data. So that's how we end up organizing these leaves. And again, every, every branch and every leaf ends up being a file that get, gets cached upstream. And that's it. I know I have about uh, four minutes left, but. And the talk, oh, there you go, awesome. All right, so Brian, I, I will 
clap on behalf of everyone else. Uh, so let's let's open it up to the audience. And if you have any questions for Brian, go for it. So uh, Wallace, do you want to ask your question? Oh, I'll ask one. So in the chat, he asked, do you have benchmark data against Neo4j and TigerGraph? Yeah, so um, again, there's two different, so the answer is no. Um, and uh, part of the reason for that is those are uh, in a di completely different class of graph database. And I know it's a little bit confusing sometimes because people I think think graphs are graphs. And there's kind of two categories of graph databases, property graphs, which those would fall into. And then, um, you know, it goes by many names, but the other type of graph, which we fall into, knowledge graph, triple store, semantic graph, name graph. Um, so two very, uh, you know, they're both graph databases, but two very different approaches at graph databases. And if anyone uh, wanted to, I, I'd be happy to get into some of those nuances. Let's see, let's see if anyone else has any questions. Otherwise, I'll be selfish and take all the time and ask questions. Uh, just a quick question. Um, I, I kind of am interested. Can you just clarify briefly what the difference is between um, a triple store and a property-based graph? I thought, um, I guess, the is, the is the primary difference that the triple store stores the property as an individual edge? Yeah, well, in the property graph uh, allows you to put properties on edges. Um, a semantic graph does not allow you to put properties on edges. So that's one big difference. Um, right. So the in but so in the in the semantic or in the property graph, that that property um, is just going to be like a pointer to an actual table for the relational data or the the columnar data, right? A, a pointer to another node or just gotcha. to a scalar value, which might be a string or a date or an integer, but yeah, or, right. or a pointer to another node. And yeah. in the case of the triple, it's like in edge or it's like in vertex, out vertex, and then the third value is the property, right? Is that correct? Um, so the how they're technically described, which I don't think is a great description, uh, is subject, uh, predicate, and then object. So subject is basically your row predicate. It would be your column or basically your edge. So that's kind of what your edge is, is, is in the middle. And then the last value is either going to, is, is another node or an object. Um, an object technically could be a scalar value, again, like a string, but it could also be a different point to a different node. Okay. Got it. Thank you. I appreciate yes. it. Yeah. And I'd say the other big difference, of course, is that, um, semantic uh, graphs are designed to leverage uh, global vocabularies and even have global identifiers or unique IRIs even for your rows, which allow you to combine across multiple data sets uh, very dynamically and in a standards-based way. Property graphs were never really designed with this standards kind of open data approach. They were designed more like, you know, here's a Here's a graph database version of MongoDB, kind of designed to be the same sort of database you would end up running behind a single application, not an interoperable set of data that can be connected across sources. Thank you. Um, so what is the consensus protocol between the, the writers, the, the, you know, the ledgers? Are they, are you assuming non-adversarial nodes in, in a cluster or a group, or are you running you know, like a you know, blockchain BFT kind of thing. Yeah, so we uh, we have a pluggable consensus, but uh, at this point, the only thing we formally support because it's for almost every use case we found, it's the only thing that's needed is Raft. And we've developed our own Raft library that uh, basically runs inside of Flurry. Um, part of the reason why Raft can be very sufficient for a lot of use cases is that every single message is cryptographically signed as well. So, you know, one of the things that, um, so PBFT is going to reduce your redundancy, uh, Byzantine fault tolerance is going to reduce your redundancy and it's going to increase your latency. Um, so, you know, the formula for redundancy in like a raft or a Paxos network is going to be uh, 2F plus one is how many servers you need to run 
where F is the number of failures. So if you want to support one failure, two times one plus one is three. You need to run three servers to support one failure. Um, and of course, two failures would be five servers. This is why it makes almost no sense to ever run an even number of servers, like in a Paxos or a RAF network. PBFT, you're going to really be, or Byzantine um, algorithm, you're, uh, I think, always going to be running a 3F plus one, which means that if you want to sustain one failure, you need to run four servers. Two failures, you need to run seven servers. So you need to run a lot more servers to sustain the same amount of failures. There's also additional communication points that happen through that. Um, so those are, those are kind of some of the trade-offs you end up having to deal with. And when you're cryptographically signing all messages, so you can prove identity across all messages, um, there's not a lot of reason to absorb the uh, extra overhead. Okay. Then I was getting to the point of like, what's the point of being, oh, it's too, like, what's the point of being decentralized if you assume everyone's a good actor, right? then why not just slap it on Amazon and be done with it as a centralized service? Well, I don't think you assume that anyone's a good actor. So there's two different uh, components to decentralization. So one is the traceability or the provenance of all the changes. And anyone can independently validate that the data and the transactions have integrity. The second part of consensus and decentralization is who gets the votes. Who gets to vote on whether a transaction is valid as it's going through? That doesn't mean that anyone else can't independently validate that it was accurate, but at the time, who gets the votes? Um, so Flurry is what is considered a private or sometimes federated blockchain, which means there's a set of parties that don't necessarily trust each other, but they, uh, you have named parties who are the decision makers. Something like public blockchains, black, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera, Cardano, those are uh, truly decentralized decision-making, but then that also takes you completely out of the category of even something like uh, the Byzantine fault tolerant algorithms like PBFT, certainly out of the category of Raft, because all of those count on voting mechanisms, but you can't obviously vote if you don't know how many participants there are, because what's 50% of the vote when you don't know you know, how many people are, are there? Again, also bad actors think that you couldn't use RAF for that because of, you do, it's easy to do denial of service on this. Um, but again, so, so I understand the, the verifiability part and that when you, you want to you know, expose an API, expose the data in such a way that someone can prove that things are all done correctly. Merkle trees would do, would do the same thing. Um, and that's, that's the, exactly basically what, what, you know, Flurry ends up constructing is, is a Merkle tree. Yeah, okay. Um, are, are you, are you, are you, same with public blockchains. I mean, that's what they yeah, you yeah, basically use as a version of a Merkle tree. But like, it, it's not completely trustless, right? Like you have to trust that the raft leader is writing, making rights that are, you know, true to, true to the things that it's receiving from the... Well, if you're receiving rights... rights Yes and no from a voting standpoint, but as you're receiving the data, you have the ability to independently validate it. So if well, that data comes through and you say, no, I don't trust this information or, you know, this identity, the signature doesn't mesh out, you do not have to accept that. So, um, sorry, so that's, a, that, that, that's a denial of service, right? If I know there should be new updates, but someone has, has peed in the pool, so to speak. Uh, then I can't get the new updates because I can't, I can't verify it. Where, where if you had a centralized data, it had full control. That's right. Yeah. No. And, and that would be the point where you would have to say, okay, you know, we have a bad actor in the network and we need to kick that person out and we need to sort out what that is. And you have all the traceability there to be able to determine that. So, you know, what, what, for example, a Byzantine fault tolerance will get you is the ability to deny that to a certain degree, although there's still ways of doing denial of service attacks on the fly, but you're paying an immense overhead to have that. Either way, you have the traceability. Like, but, but like if, from, if a the, software engineer, so rather, sorry, from, from a software engineering standpoint, like you're pushing this now down to the, the end user of the application to say, hey, 
it's up to you to figure out that this bad thing happened and it's up to you to figure out how to reconcile it. It's almost like vector clocks, right? It's like those things are fantastic because they allow you to be scalable, but like you're pushing it on the application developer to have to reconcile these things and fix things up. And I think well, that's a, it's, 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 it's a, it's a trade-off and I, I don't think that's the right way to go in my opinion, because I think if people, are, people just don't have the mental bandwidth and have, they just want to write, write queries on their data, but they have to do a bunch of extra stuff because of this extra, you know, this trust mechanism that you're, you're, you're forcing upon them. Well, I completely agree, which is why, for example, you, Andy, might run your own query server for a set of data at Carnegie Mellon and me as an app developer, I may trust you enough that I'm just going to trust you to act as a query server. Otherwise, I can run my own server, but the identical thing happens in public blockchains. If I actually want to trust Bitcoin, I have to run my own node. Otherwise, Wait, I'm trusting your, someone your else. Your competitor, I, I don't think your competitor is blockchain, is like you know, the, the Bitcoin people. Your competitor would be, uh, you know, whatever the Neptune from Amazon or TLDB or Neo4j, right? These, these big mega corporations that have a lot of money that can run these services uh, and you know, people and people trust them. I guess what I'm, I guess what I'm, the core of I'm getting at is like, what's the, what's, and I asked you this before, like, what's the, like, the sweet spot for you guys that, like, you know, you would never want to run on Amazon. You never want to run on, you know, another cloud service. You want to run it in sort of the, the decentralized model that you're proposing. Uh, people who are looking for interoperable, it's, it's the data centric uh, positioning that I started out with. People who want interoperable data that's going to be shared across parties in a trusted manner. <laughs>